thank you. I want to apologize on behalf of American Airlines for not being there in person today. Um, I'm going to focus on the mental health services and interventions for children based on almost 20 years in the field since the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing and on the experiences of others and the literature. The first slide after the title slide should say Disaster Mental Health System of Care. That's up. Um, the Disaster Mental Health System of Care relies on existing and new programs and networks to reach survivors with a range of needs. <clears throat> a framework for intervention considers a variety of factors which are uh, listed on this slide in general categories. The needs of children <clears throat> commonly based on their disaster exposures and reactions, aspects of the disaster, the disaster phase, and the social ecology. Second slide, please. Uh, because disasters threaten children's assumptions that the world is safe and predictable, services may be needed for children who reside in the general community where a disaster strikes, as well as for those who are more directly affected. Thus, the system of care includes components for two distinct populations. The public health component is for the general child population. It emphasizes coping and resilience and includes efforts to identify children who may need services. The clinical component is designed for severe or enduring reactions in those with direct exposures or pre-existing vulnerabilities. Next slide, please, which should be on assessment. Uh, one of my concerns over the years that I've worked in the field has been the relatively little attention to assessment. While some services are appropriate for universal populations, referral and clinical interventions and traditional treatment should be anchored in assessment. In conducting assessments, it's imperative to query children directly as well as obtaining observations from caregivers because for a variety of reasons, untrained adults tend to underestimate children's reactions and needs. Another concern is that when assessments are conducted, they commonly fail to match the outcomes to the populations and context. For example, an assessment of children in the general population might address fear and distress, and an evaluation of universal public health interventions might appropriately measure outcomes like hazard knowledge and coping rather than diagnostic conditions. The next slide, which should say assessment two. Um, we advocate screening if large numbers of children were exposed to an event to identify those in need of further evaluation or services and for groups of children in which individual exposures and reactions are unknown. Screening shouldn't be conducted in the absence of a mechanism to refer children for the services that the results suggest are needed, however. Clinical evaluation is appropriate for children with severe or enduring reactions who may require clinical interventions or traditional mental health treatment. These assessments should identify pre-existing conditions and other vulnerabilities as well as disaster-related psychopathology. Next slide uh, should say stepped approach. A stepped approach, which is composed of sequenced interventions, has many advantages, including the appropriate use of resources. This approach provides, for example, public health interventions to the broader population of children, with additional interventions delivered to smaller numbers of children based on an assessment of their clinical status and need. Next slide. 
uh, disaster interventions have, are delivered in various sites, which have already been mentioned. These include schools, health and mental health care facilities, and other community settings. Factors in, important in determining the setting are detailed on this slide and include things like the location and magnitude of the disaster, characteristics of the community, the availability of venues like schools and clinics to offer services, accessibility for families, the expertise of available professionals to deliver the interventions, and feasibility. The next slide is on school-based services. Schools provide a natural and popular venue for conducting public health activities like delivering psychoeducation psycho and social support, assessing and monitoring affected children, and identifying and triaging children with problems that warrant more intensive or sophisticated professional attention. Schools also can be used to deliver clinical services. Uh, recognizing the heightened vulnerability of children to disasters, our field has seen a proliferation of mental health interventions for children since the September 11th attacks. Uh, the next slide should be on evidence-based interventions. Our team recently reviewed the Child Disaster Mental Health Intervention Evidence Base and found almost 50 packaged interventions specifically for children in disaster situations. Most of the interventions contained multiple components, commonly based on cognitive behavioral approaches and considerable consistency in the, text, in the techniques that are being used. Our analysis suggested that most of the interventions studied were beneficial, but relatively few studies compared interventions, and for the most part, studies didn't dismantle constituent components to identify the specific techniques that were responsible for benefit. It also wasn't always clear what constituted meaningful change, as opposed to statistically significant findings, in response to the interventions. This was especially true and important for public health interventions administered to general populations of children in, for example, school settings. Uh, there should be a second slide next on evidence-based interventions. Intervention evaluation is essential. Without it, we risk assuming inaccurately that we've helped children when that may not be the case. And while we tend to think that disaster mental health services are harmless, lesson from debriefing studies, for example, suggests that we should be cognizant of the possibility for adverse effects. The potential for natural recovery complicates the interpretation of results as some trauma symptoms may recede over time without intervention, uh, but some studies revealed stable increased symptoms or slower recovery and no intervention was administered. And <clears throat> I think importantly, studies haven't addressed the common factors among interventions that might influence outcomes. These include, for example, the therapeutic relationship, the expectation of success, the process of acknowledging and confronting the problem, and the opportunity to ventilate and develop mastery over the issues and problems. And then would you put the final slide up? Um, I would conclude by saying that Multiple approaches appear to benefit children in the disaster context, but it isn't clear what distinct and common elements of these interventions are responsible for the benefit. And moreover, the evidence base is inconclusive about which children are most likely to benefit and what approaches are most likely to be beneficial. And finally, I would say that while the science of intervention evaluation advances, 
so too must attention to service delivery issues with efforts to equip those delivering the interventions with needed training and resources. Great job, uh, uh, Betty. I can't wait to ask you a couple of questions. Um, and, um, but uh, I am also eager to uh, listen to Doug Walker, who is the clinical director at Mercy Family Center. Doug, um, hold on a second and let me just see. And like magic, your slides are on the screen. Great. Thank you.